الاستاذ الدكتور محمد التومي طب هيستوك از اباوت نيونيتال انتستينال ابستراكشن اسامبل الجوريزم فور كومبلكس بروبلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم جميعا مستر شيرمان دير كوليجز ليز اند جنتلمان اتس اولويز ا بليجر تو بي هير بارتيسيبيتنج ان ذا اكتيفيتيز اوف ذا ايجيبشن سوسايتي فور ديجن نيرك ميديسن كونفرنس توداي ايل بي توكينج اباوت نيوتيت اند ساين ابستراكشن ذس از وان اوف ماي وان اوف ذا فيفر توبكس تو مي اند اكشولي ذس واز ماي ماستر ديجري سيتيز توبك اند ذس از وات جوت مي انتو بيدياتريك ايميجينج So just like Hollywood, when they do uh, reboots or remakes for their, uh, uh, their movies or series, I'm doing the latest edition or the latest reboot for my uh, uh, talk today about unital intestinal obstruction. Um, I was asked the, uh, a few months ago to give uh, a course in uh, pediatric imaging, and this is one of the very common topics you would see if you are working in a, a place attached to pediatric radiologists or pediatric surgeons. Uh, There, there, there wouldn't be a week where you could uh, encounter one of these cases uh, of neonatal and sinal obstruction. So uh, when I was doing a revision of the literature, uh, I found this very interesting paper just published this year, earlier this year, and it's by uh, Tsitu uh, et al. And one of the co-authors is Dr. Savas Andriniku, uh, who I've, I've met uh, back in 2014 uh, during the ICR. Uh, And I, I, I really liked the, the approach for uh, how to diagnose neonates and start obstruction in a very simple algorithm and a simple way just by uh, asking ourselves questions and having this flow chart with yes, with, with yes and no answers. Uh, so just to remember the few points, uh, when doing neonatal and sign obstruction, it's not like adults. Always consider that uh, children have their uh, special uh, consideration. So we do high obstruction or low obstruction. We don't do small or large bowel obstruction like adults. Usually high obstruction will present by vomiting, which is usually vom uh, bilious stained. And when I'm talking about vomiting, I'm talking about the first two or three days in life, 24 to 72 hours of life. Or if you have low obstruction, that's like beyond the uh, mid jejunum and uh, involving the ileum and large uh, bowel, you will have to fail to, uh, failure to pass meconium during this time. So what's the first question we have to ask? Uh, we'll ha uh, one of the nice things about neonatal imaging is you use very simple imaging techniques, just like x-rays or contrast studies and sometimes ultrasound. So our first question, we will do an x-ray for the baby. We should know if it's normal or abnormal. And if it's abnormal, uh, what's the level of obstruction? So this is our first question. Uh, on uh, the first slide here on the left side, we have the normal bowel pattern for the baby. In the babies, you, don't, you cannot discriminate between small and large bowels. You have this bubbly appearance, or as it was described in the, uh, in the paper, uh, as cube appearance. You have like these squares, which are adjacent to each other, having this cube configuration, like multiple cubes attached to each other. So this is the normal bowel gas distribution in a neonate. You can't discriminate between small or large bowel. And then we have this tube configuration, as described by the paper. Tubes, like you have these dilated bowel loops, which are uh, dilated and air-filled, resembling these large tubes. So if I see the one on the left here, this is normal. If I see this tube configuration and these dilated bowel loops, this is a tube configuration, this is abnormal, and uh, this denotes bowel obstruction. Secondly, what is the level of obstruction? As we know, the level of obstruction is always related to the number of air fluid levels. Do I have one or two or three or more than one air fluid level? This is our next question. So question number one, plain X-ray, is it normal, abnormal? And what is the level of obstruction? Going on to our next part of the organism. How many gas bubbles do I have? Do I have one, two, or three gas bubbles? Okay, this is high obstruction. If I have this uh, plain X-ray on the right, we have the double bubble sign, which we are all familiar with. And uh, if you have this one, you have like three bubbles or four bubbles. This is proximal jejunal obstruction. But note something. If you look in the distal bowel, there isn't any air in the distal bowel. This is very, very important. When you compare it to the other one here on the right side of uh, the slide, we have like two or three uh, 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 bowel gas bubbles. But if you look here closely, you will find these small scattered bowel uh, gas uh, bubbles. Uh, 
So if you have this appearance, like a double or triple bubble sign, this is high obstruction, and you don't have any distal bowel gas, this baby will immediately go to surgery. There is no need for contrast study. There is no need for any other further investigation. This baby will be explored directly. But if you have this appearance where you have two or three bubbles, and then you have these scattered distal bowel gas, this, uh, uh, the, you have to do an emergency upper GI contrast study. Why is that? Because you'll have one of these three appearance. Please remember, please remember, if you have a high obstruction and you do an upper GI contrast study, your main aim is to document where is the duodenal junction. This is the aim of the upper GI contrast study in neonatal bowel obstruction. You want to document, though, so when you have this reference image of a normal upper GI contrast study, you have to look for the duodenal junction, which is usually in the left hypochondrium. This is what you don't want to document, okay? If you have any other uh, location of the duodenal junction other than this part in the left hypochondrium, then you have a problem. What are the problems we can see? We can have this configuration, which we have here. This is incomplete duodenal obstruction, or we have like duodenal atresia. Usually, there is a duodenal membrane with a small opening in it, giving this uh, uh, familiar appearance of the wind sock. And this is the wind sock. This is a device which they use for uh, determining the wind direction and speed. They use it in meteorological stations and airports and so. And this is what you are familiar with when you read the literature. This is the wind sock appearance of duodenal atresia or incomplete duodenal obstruction. The other most uh, common things you could see is male rotation with mid-gut volvulus giving the corkscrew appearance. And this is a surgical emergency because in these cases, you have um, um, a liability for injuring the bowel because of the compromise of the, bowel, uh, the blood supply to the bowel. So this is a surgical emergency. If you have this appearance, you should report it immediately to the surgeon because this baby will go to surgery immediately to uh, untangle this uh, mess. And sometimes you would find an abnormal duodenal junction, like this case of mal rotation, but sometimes it's silent. The baby would come with intermittent vomiting or maybe sometimes abdominal pain, and this is what we call a silent mal rotation. You can see here that the, you lose the normal C curve of the duodenum, refer to this normal appearance here, and you have the duodenal junction here on the right side. So these are the main three findings you will find in an upper GI contrast study for a case of high obstruction. So what about, what about low obstruction? We again go back to our flow chart here. This is the normal bowel. I said this is the tube configuration or the soap bubble ap appearance of the normal bowel. And then this is the tube configuration denoting this bowel obstruction. Uh, a note they said, and um, uh, it's worth mentioning, if this baby clinically has persistent bilious vomiting, then you would go back to the first step before and do uh, an upper GI contrast study just to exclude mal rotation. Okay, so, but the common thing is when you have this tube configuration denoting a distal bowel obstruction, then we will go to have a contrast enema. So, what are the findings we could see in a contrast enema? This is the, tu uh, this is the tube configuration, the X ray. We can have a small unused colon, or which we most refer to as a microcolon, and I always emphasize that microcolon is a sign, not a diagnosis. So what do we have here? We have a small unused colon. This colon has not been, uh, uh, nothing has passed in this colon during the uh, fetal life. So the colon um, uh, caliber is markedly reduced. And when we try to force the uh, contrast here to the ileum, it's not passing to the ileum. So this is a case of distal ileal atresia. Uh, another thing, you can have a small unused colon or a microcolon. And of course, when we're doing a contrast enema, you try to attempt to push the contrast as far as you can into the distal ileum. What do we have here? We have a distended ileum with multiple filling defects and we have this pellet-like appearance or pellet-like filling defects. And this is a case of uh, 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 Moconium ileus syndrome. Another common finding we could encounter uh, uh, almost weekly, you'd have this uh, appearance of an inverted rectus sigmoid tissue, have this spasticity of the rectum, and the transitional zone and the dilated sigmoid, and this is one of the pathognomonic findings in cases of Hirsch-Sprung disease. Another thing you could see also, you can see here the small left colon syndrome, where you have the rectum, sigmoid, and descending colon having a smaller caliber with a transitional zone in the, uh, usually in the adisplenic uh, flexure. But please note, 
uh, when, when diagnosing a small, uh, a small left colon syndrome or a, a, a functional immaturity of the colon, this is another name for it, this is what we call a diagnosis by exclusion because this could be a case of Hirschsprung disease. Hirschsprung disease would require surgery. Small unused colon usually will relieve by a, couple, um, by, by a few hours or a couple of days after doing the contrast enema. So again, if you have low obstruction, please do an enema. And this is the flow chart very simply, uh, as, uh, um, as, as I took a screenshot from it, uh, from uh, the paper. And again, this is just a magnified view, revising what I've said. You have to do an x-ray, you check the number of air fluid levels. Do I have uh, uh, a single or double or triple bubble sign? Do I have distal gas or I don't? Do I have the cube's appearance or I have the tube's appearance of low obstruction? If I have bilia, uh, bilious vomiting in a normal X-ray, just do an upper GI to check if you have man rotation or not. And here you will do a, a low contrast study. Again, this is the patterns, uh, several patterns of gas, bowl, pattern, uh, of gas bowel in the neonate that give us this nice flow chart. So this is just to sum up what I've said in these uh, few slides. I, I like to add some trips and tricks and do and don'ts. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've seen a lot of cases. I've done a lot of mistakes. I don't want you to do it. So one of the things, if you have like this single bubble, actually you would say this is gastric obstruction. Please remember, gastric atresia is an extremely, extremely rare condition. Over my 20 years of pediatric, service, uh, pediatric uh, radiology uh, uh, practice, I've just seen one case. And even I, I missed the radiograph, I don't know where I've uh, placed it. So don't, don't rush a gastric atresia. This doesn't uh, occur very commonly. Uh, just put a tube and aspirate some fluid. You'll have the double bubble sign here. This is what's the case of duodenal atresia. One other thing, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis may present in the neonatal life, but it will present about two or three weeks after the baby is born. And this is a very familiar uh, diagnosis we can early, easily pick up by ultrasound, and this is the normal appearance we are all familiar with. Another thing, if you do an enema, an enema also can give you an idea about the bowel rotation. This is a normal enema. You have the ileocecal junction in the right iliac fossa. If you don't have the ileocecal junction in the right iliac fossa, consider a male rotation. And this was the case in this, this baby. This baby was presenting by failure to pass meconium, we did a contrast enema, and then we find the ileocecal junction here in the uh, epigastric region. I took this baby to ultrasound, and what I found, I found the typical whirlpool sign of male rotation with mid-gut vulvus, and this baby was explored and proven to be a case of male, male, uh, male rotation with mid-gut vulvus. So remember, an upper GI contrast study, you will document the DJG uh, position. In a lower GI uh, contrast study, please document the ileocecal junction position. Uh, another thing, a good radiologist, uh, radiologist is a good observer. Use the cues and the information the patient gives you in the plain X-ray. If you see this plain X-ray here, we have these multiple dilated bowel loops, and then we have this thinly calcified lesion here, and this usually uh, uh, denotes uh, an, aseptic, an aseptic protonitis which occurred as a, bowel, uh, a result of bowel perforation, and this is very common in cases of meconium uh, alias syndrome. Uh, they usually have intrauterine bowel perforations, and they have this meconium pseudocyst, which sometimes calcify, and then we did an enema, and we found out that it was a meconium alias syndrome. Please, 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 this is a very interesting case I've done a few years ago. One of the things we didn't mention is colonic atresia. It's a little bit rare, but it happens. What you have here is we have a distal bowel obstruction. We have this uh, accumulation of meconium. We did a contrast study, and this is the uh, abrupt termination of the contrast here at the splenic flexion, and this was a case of colonic atresia. But on the other hand here, this was a baby which was presented to me about three weeks of age. The baby condition was very, very bad, and unfortunately, the clinician asked for an upper GI contrast study for this baby. Why? To determine the level of obstruction. You don't do that in a case of low obstruction. Please don't do an upper GI contrast for a case of low obstruction. What happened here? This was the plain X-ray. The baby had an upper GI contrast study. As you can see, the contrast is still retained and you cannot determine where is the obstruction. What I did is I did a lower contrast enema. You can see here that this baby had a colonic atresia at the level of the splenic flexure. And the interesting finding here, uh, this is the contrast I, I gave the baby. And this is the contrast from the contrast study she had when she was one week old. She came to be when she was 21 days or three weeks old. So you see the contrast didn't go anywhere. We didn't determine 
the level of obstruction, it was uh, determined by a low contrast study. This is something I emphasize because a lot of times I get from the clinician, we have a low obstruction, please do an upper GI, uh, upper GI contrast study. We don't do that. If you have a low obstruction, you do an enema. If you have an, eye, an upper GI contrast, uh, uh, you have an upper GI obstruction, you do an upper GI contrast just to document the position of the DGG. The last thing is when you do Hirschsprung disease, please, there are several considerations for doing a Hirschsprung disease. This is the proper uh, technique. You use a small catheter, you give a little bit of contrast time by time, you use, you, uh, the, uh, have the early filling films of the lat in the lateral position. So you can see this baby only had one film and we diagnosed Hirschsprung disease. When you just fill the colon, you are documenting that you filled the entire colon. But this image enough is enough for diagnosing Hirschsprung disease. Uh, these are uh, cases I got from one of my friend's uh, surgeon which are done uh, in a wrong manner. What, what did they do wrong? You inflate the balloon. If you inflate the balloon, you, you could miss the diagnosis. Another thing, uh, uh, if you over uh, fill the colon, you could miss your diagnosis. You have to get the contrast incrementally and take the early lateral filling films. Uh, thank you very much. I hope I didn't go, uh, I go, I did go over my time. I'm sorry. I tried to go as fast as possible. شكرا جزيلا دكتور محمد ونظرا لان احنا الحقيقه تعدينا الوقت بتاع السيشن فهننهي